You know what? It's a, it's a weird story. I was walking down the street one day, and you know, I be looking at asses and shit, and I seen little yoga pants coming out the nail salon. So I looked, I peeped the ass out, and I was like, damn, she thick as fuck. Turn around, TT. I was like, damn, nigga, what you doing out here with all this ass? Double cheeked up on a Thursday afternoon, hella ass. The sun is still out, my nigga, and it, uh, it was just, it, it, I, I, I don't know what I mean. Extra thick! In 2010, the world of animation was introduced to How to Train Your Dragon, and it looked... I guess it's just you and me, huh? No, just you. Huh? Focus, Hiccup! Can I transfer to the class with the cool Vikings? <laughs> Fine from the trailers, but man, I don't think anyone expected for this movie to be as good as it is. 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, over half a billion dollars in the box office, two sequels, a TV show that lasted eight whole seasons. It cannot be denied the impact that How to Train Your Dragon had. Next to Kung Fu Panda and Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon is one of DreamWorks' best franchises. One they're perfectly fine with milking to death, but that's besides the point. My point is some Spanish dude named Antonio Banderas decided to rip it off. That's probably the weirdest part about this, if I'm being honest. I'm not surprised How to Train Your Dragon got a knockoff. I mean, look at the Cars franchise, or Kung Fu Panda. If an animated movie is successful, then if anything, having a cheap knockoff is a sign that you've certainly made it. At least financially. The part that really gets me is that Antonio Banderas is behind this shit. Yeah, the guy who starred in Shrek, Spy Kids, and most famously, Zorro made some cheap knockoff of How to Train Your Dragon that was released solely in Spain and the UK. Sure, he was just the producer, but look at that poster. Look at his name proudly placed on top of it. Ooh, and that one too. And that one. And don't forget about that one. Even the movie begins with his name right there for everyone to see. Antonio really wants everyone to know he made this. This is his child, and the world must accept it. He even voices a character in the movie named Sir Clorox, who's just this diet Gaston, but we'll talk about that later. And before you go into the comments, I know his name is actually Clorex, but this character is literally the physical embodiment of Bleach, so the joke writes itself. The movie is called Justin and the Knights of Valor, and while it's no video bring Quato film, it's definitely very familiar if I do say so myself. You've probably heard of this movie before, back when it first released in 2013. It had like one or two trailers, you saw the main character riding a dragon-like creature, and probably thought the same exact thing I did. And let me tell you guys, the trailer did not disappoint. No, I, I want to become a knight. Are you crazy? Strange boy. Forget the fairy tales. <gasps> because real heroes... Justin? Justin! Justin! A noble but rather lame name. Come in all shapes and sizes. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> While it's not the same movie, really, you can definitely tell that Higher Train Your Dragon was a huge influence. The movie is about a skinny teen who's an outcast in his society. He has a crush on a blonde girl who doesn't notice that he exists. His father has a plan for him, but he doesn't want to live by it, so he has to sneak off in order to find himself. While all that's going on, a large threat comes in to threaten our main character's very way of life, and so it's up to our main character, using the things he's learned, to not only save the day, but also prove to everyone how they were wrong. Like I said, it's like me and Antonio have really good taste in movies. Again, it's not video bring Quato bad, but this movie just feels so disingenuous. I mean, just look at our main character. Look at Justin and tell me he's not just Hiccup Haddock. Like, come the fuck on. His love interest is a girl with a long braid who can fight. Like. Really? I will be fair though, it was the marketing that built this movie up to be worse than it actually is. It isn't completely ripping off Hedge Your Dragon most of the time, but when it's trying to stand on its own two legs, it becomes the most boring knockoff in history. The words generic and stale are compliments when it comes to how little this movie can engage you. A lot of this comes from the fact that this movie has a huge problem in actually being a movie and letting the audience see what's going on. Remember the first 10 minutes of Big Hero 6 with the obnoxious exposition that didn't add anything to the movie? Well imagine the whole movie like that. So many conversations and so much of the characters' motivations and personalities all come from them just talking about them. Basically, it's the last airbender again. I want to be a knight like grandpa. Your grandpa was an asshole. Your grandpa wasn't an asshole. The queen is an asshole. Knights are so fucking cool. You're right. Knights are really cool. Actually, no. Knights are assholes. Hey, movie, since you love talking about assholes so much, how about you show me an asshole instead? 
Yeah, I said it. Bring me an ass. <laughs> okay, I'll admit, I, I walked right into that one, didn't I? Not that I'm complaining, though. Extra thin! There's so much lore to this movie involving the knights and how they got outlawed, and it all sounds pretty interesting, but it's never really focused on nor really shown to us until we're like halfway through the movie. But even by that point, the exposition has already told us everything we need to know. Why not just start the movie off with that explanation and show the audience how we got to where we are now? Not to mention this movie just keeps repeating itself over and over again. Almost like the movie thinks we have the memory of a pigeon and we're gonna forget. Knights are outlawed. You would be breaking the law and I will not let my son do that. Maybe the law's wrong. What? And now after living in exile and alone, I have to join forces with the same vermin I once swore to fight. Why didn't you listen? I'll always care about you and your family. Roland holds a special place in my heart. <laughs> Thank you, movie. You don't need to remind us every 10 minutes that the knights are outlawed and Justin's dad hates them and so on. The sky is blue and I have a dick. Thank you. Sometimes the movie will just outright state what's going on in the scene for no good reason at all. I wonder how Justin's doing. I hope he's okay. He's fine. How do you know? Did you connect with him telepathically? No, he's fine because you're still thinking about him. Real cute, Mel. But he's not my type. She likes him. Well, for once we agree on something. Thank you, movie. My dumb baby brain couldn't possibly tell that she liked the guy she had two whole conversations with, but was still thinking about. It's almost like it's pretty fucking obvious! I always served you faithfully and never failed you until you failed us. Who, who are you talking to? Why are you explaining your evil plan to a chair? What does this movie do with talking? I'm sorry if I sound repetitive, but it's just such a recurring problem for this movie. It acts like it's impossible to show and not tell. I'm not expecting Pixar levels of good writing, but does this movie have to spoon feed every ounce of information to us like we're fucking children? And yeah, I know this is the movie made for children, but as I've said a million times on this channel, being made for children is not an excuse for the movie to be bad. Children did not make this movie, adults made this movie. These adults got paid to make this movie. Hold them accountable when they make shit! Speaking of holding people accountable, it's time to talk about the characters and how they have absolutely no character at all! Remember when I said a lot of the characters' motivations and personalities come from the dialogue? Well, that's because their characters often just talk about what they want, what they have, what they had, how they're gonna get it. It's like I said, exposition is such a big problem with this movie, especially when our main character is probably the worst of them all. Justin has zero personality outside of just wanting to be a knight. He wants to be a knight because he loves them and it's what his grandpa was. Too bad, once again, we're just told that they were super close to each other and Justin's grandpa was just an amazing guy. Got at least we actually got to see Tadashi interact with Hiro before he blew up. Seeing him and Hiro do the fist bump thing and then Hiro use it on Baymax, that's the power of show don't tell right there. That was genuinely nice. But there's nothing like that here. It's just like, your grandpa was a great man. I was like five when he died though. Take my word for it. Everyone else has to. Justin's character revolves entirely around his desires with nothing making him feel like a real person. Now let's take a look at Hiccup and his desires and his personality. His desire is wanting to kill dragons at first, but over time it changes based on the things he learns about them. Now he wants to protect them from the other Vikings, which they basically made their religion to hunt down. Eventually, Hiccup comes to the realization that it wasn't killing dragons he wanted, but just to be accepted. And the funny thing is, the one person that accepted him before anyone else did was a dragon. 300 years and I'm the first Viking who wouldn't kill a dragon. First to ride one though. I wouldn't kill him because he looked as frightened as I was. I looked at him, and I saw myself. That is what we call a character arc. Hiccup wanted something, but didn't even realize what he wanted. And over time, what he wanted changed because he changed. That's development, baby. How does Justin change, though? What tangible character growth does Justin undergo in this movie? Does his desire change anywhere in the movie? Does he gain a new insight of some kind to the world of knights? No? That's my point. Justin is just some guy who wants something, and in the end, he gets exactly what he wants. He doesn't make any bold sacrifices or compromises. He doesn't take any major risks since the world really doesn't seem to care. Like, seriously, in this world, knights are illegal, and yet people can just go to this castle and be trained to become a knight? Like, seriously, how does that even work? 
Sir Clorox goes around and lies to everyone that he's a knight, and yet he doesn't get arrested? Uh-oh, he's a knight! He's trying to be a knight, everyone! Say no one cares. Why should we be invested in him breaking the law if there's no risk, no consequence? Why should we be invested in his journey if he doesn't learn anything or change? On top of that, he has little to no personality. Can you name one semblance of personality from this guy? Like, is he funny? Is he quirky? Smart? Cautious? Well, I guess he's brave and dedicated, but that's pretty one note. Almost reminds me of someone else who is brave and dedicated. Hiccup has a personality, though. He's a smartass, he's compassionate, he's awkward, he's brilliant, he's willing to stand up for what he wants even though it'll be unpopular. Hiccup is a fully realized character while Justin is just a blank slate. He's just a super nice main character with no real flaws. He just wants to be a knight, he wants to get the girl and that's it. Except Hiccup fighting for it was actually believable. Remember that scene during Dragon Training where Astra got mad at Hiccup for constantly causing trouble? I remember people kind of hated her for that scene, but looking back now, you completely understand her mainly because we've seen where she's coming from. In the opening of the movie, Hiccup caused all of that destruction and damage, and that wasn't even the first time he had done that. On top of that, they've all been raised to hate dragons and kill them when they get the chance. Hiccup constantly falling all over himself and the others is getting in the way of that. She's 100% justified, as is the rest of Burke. They're not just being dicks to him for no reason. Hiccup really was screwing up tremendously. But with that being said, you still relay with Hiccup. You never feel like he's trying to hurt people, he just wants to fit in. His problem wasn't that he was too different, or, well, it was, but he didn't realize it yet. But his problem was he was trying too hard to be like everyone else when he couldn't be. That made the ending where who he had become in the end all the more satisfying. Who he had become completely changed Burke and everyone in it for the better. He became accepted by everyone, and he gained a new perspective on dragons and vikings as a whole. Now compare that to Justin who just wants something, gets it, and doesn't learn shit. I mean, I guess the closest thing we get to development in any form is that Justin in this very brief moment at the end decides he doesn't want to be a knight anymore because it would hurt his father. But that moment literally lasts for like 10 seconds because the father just decides out of nowhere to stop being an over controlling dick. It makes no impact on anything, and it just feels completely forced and out of fucking nowhere. With that being said though, the father ends up going through a far better character arc than the main character does. But even then, it's just Stoic's character arc only way worse. Mainly because Reginald disappears for a large chunk of the film. We barely get to see it sink in how his son's leaving affects him. There's one scene of him getting mad, and then he's gone from the movie for over 40 minutes! By then, Justin's already on his way back home. But no, the movie really wants us to see how Justin's father is feeling about his son leaving, except obviously not since he's been out of the movie for almost half of it! Remember how much Stoic and Hiccup were together in the first movie? Remember how they actually tried to talk to each other? It was messy. It was awkward. Stoic couldn't relate to his son at all, but there was still effort there. Remember when Stoic disowned Hiccup and we then see just how much that devastated him to say? That moment was felt because we saw them interact like a real father and son would. But in this movie, they share one scene together in the beginning and boom, Justin's gone. No letters back and forth, no visits, not even a flashback or something to really emphasize how close they are to each other. Because they're just not. There's no connection between the two characters, so the reconciliation just feels so empty and forced. But again, at least Reginald changes, so that's something, I guess. The love interest is just that. The love interest. Probably the most predictable, standard love interest I've seen in a while. Just exactly what you'd expect when you think about a strong female character. She's a tough badass who don't take any bullshit, but when a quiet nerdy guy comes in and is nice to her one time, suddenly everything's different. Seriously, name one thing to this woman other than she likes knights, she likes Justin, and she can fight. Well, she's got five brothers, and she's, uh, she's got a, <clears throat> she's a, uh, Smash. I will give her this, she has a lot of potential, if, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> anyway, moving on. The wizard is pretty obnoxious. His running gag is screaming at himself because he has MPD, and as we all know, screaming equals comedy. And the villain. Oh boy! What wasted potential. Talk about the one good thing this movie had going for it, but then they completely shit on it. The main villain's name is... is... 
Heraclio. <laughs> I guess they wanted to pick a name that nobody had used before without realizing why no one would pick such a name. You couldn't call him something a little simpler, like George or Alvin? Shit, I'd take Sean over fucking Heraclio. <laughs> Oh my god. That's why for all intents and purposes, and because it's funnier, for the rest of this review, I'm just gonna call him Dale. Because in one scene, he actually commits pocket sand, and that's all I can think about. There is no honor in seizing power by force. I would rather die. So be it. Pocket sand. Ah! Yeah! Dale is a former knight who is pissed about the fact that knights are now outlawed, so he wants to kill the queen and take over the kingdom. Now, from the start, save for the god-awful exposition, he's actually pretty solid. He looks pretty intimidating, he's voiced by Mark Strong of all people, that's just really good casting, and his motivation is pretty believable. I like how he actually hates being forced to work with criminals in order to achieve his goals. There's one scene in the movie where you think he's gonna do the typical kill one of his own minions to prove just how evil he is, but they actually subvert that trope. I mean, it's not great, but considering how generic this movie is overall, I'm surprised they managed to surprise me at all. There's also the whole thing about outlawing knights. Y you're probably wondering why on earth they would even do that to begin with. Well, because they just passed a bunch of laws, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so the Queen's logic was that if Justin's dad, who's a lawyer for the kingdom, made just about everything illegal, then all crime would stop. And I don't think lawyers make laws? Like, like at all? This movie's a conservative Republican's wet dream. You see, Democrats, making things illegal doesn't stop crimes from being committed. You'll just end up making more crimes. And this movie actually kind of proves that point. The movie just opens up with people either getting tickets or just straight up being arrested because of how many laws there are. I get it's mostly played off as a joke, but this is still the catalyst for Dale's motivation. Because of all the laws, the queen no longer views the knights as viable, so she outlaws them, and by her, I mean Justin's father outlaws them. We later learn the only reason he did this was because he didn't want his father to die, which ironically ends up happening. For some odd reason, the movie never once brings up this irony. Like, seriously, imagine a scene where Justin calls his father out as his law was the reason Roland died. But no, that would be too complex and interesting for this dumb baby movie, now wouldn't it? What I'm saying is, Dale actually has a good point. The movie shows all these laws just succeed in making everyone miserable, and the Queen just stood back and let Reginald do whatever he wanted. Dale is 100% right, the Queen was being weak. She and Reginald weren't making the kingdom safer, they were just taking people's freedoms away, which ironically did make more crime. It's kind of like prohibition if you think about it. What started off as having good intentions just led to more disorder and chaos, and yet strangely, I feel like Dale is doing absolutely nothing wrong. If anything, he's going to liberate the kingdom from the oppressive government and return everyone's freedoms and livelihoods to them. Fuck it, I'd follow him. Sure, he's going to be killing people, but as a knight goes, that's kind of expected of him, isn't it? So let me get this straight, movie. You're telling me that Dale is evil because he's gonna kill people when that's literally the entire point of being a knight? To defend the country from invaders and shit? There's even a scene in the movie that explains this! I know killing is wrong, and I do like how Dale actually hates having to resort to it, but that's the kind of complexity that can really separate an animated movie made for dumb babies and an animated movie that respects its audience. They killed hundreds of us! And we've killed thousands of them! I was willing to forgive this dumb society that has so many laws that it wouldn't even function properly because there was at least a point to it. But as the movie goes on, sadly Dale just gets worse and worse and worse. I guess the movie realized as it went on that Dale was becoming too relatable and <laughs> even incorrigible to an extent. So in the end, they suddenly make him this one note asshole who's perfectly okay with murder and just wants to take over the kingdom because fuck the knights, Fuck bringing back order and giving people their freedoms back. I just want power because Justin's the hero of the story. And we can't have a hero fight a villain with relatable goals because then the audience would get confused on who to root for. Hey geniuses, maybe that would be a good thing. Maybe that would make the fight between Justin and Dale actually interesting to watch. It wouldn't just be a sword fight between good and evil, it would actually be two different beliefs clashing into each other. Neither side would be 100% in the right or wrong. If anything, the fight shouldn't even be about the kingdoms at all. It should be about Justin just trying to avenge his grandfather. Personal conflicts are way more engaging than just simple good versus evil fights. Because then, it's actually making you, the audience, think. But like I said before, this dumb baby movie can't have that. Just have Dale be ruthlessly evil out of nowhere and then just have him fall to his death. 
completely ruining any chance of possible forgiveness or redemption or anything like that. Justin wins, guys! Oh, ain't that swell! Good always beats evil, even when it's not that evil. In fact, I dare say Justin bringing the knights back is pretty hypocritical, considering that's what Dale wanted in the first place. So what you're telling me, movie, is it's good when Justin wanted it and was willing to kill people for it, but not when Dale wanted it and was willing to kill people for it. Thanks, movie! You didn't even bother trying with that. Justin's masters are so forgettable that it hurts. I actually forgot all their names and I don't care enough to look them up. They're just the typical kind of masters you'd expect. You got the physical one who sees the potential in the boy and becomes something of a father figure to him. You got the strict one who's really hard on the boy, but he comes from a place of genuine concern. Then you have this one who's just weird, but not a good weird. His running gag is that he has seizures all the time. That's a joke, I think. It's not really funny though, especially when the movie keeps sending me mixed messages about it. Sometimes you're supposed to laugh at his misery, sometimes you're an asshole for laughing at his misery. How dare you? And finally, there's Sir Clorox. Basically just a Gaston wannabe without any of the charm or the meme energy. He's just a dickhead who's obsessed with women and money because that's such a compelling character. If I say compelling, I meant pointless. I really can't think of a reason why he's even in this movie. He doesn't impact it in any substantial way. All Sir Clorox does is basically steal time away from our main character and villain, which could have been used to develop both way more. But instead, we just focus on him being an awkward scumbag. But he's not even a funny one or anything. I hate how he's just able to lie about being a knight and everyone just blindly believes him. Like, what? You wanna know what made Gaston so fun? It was his ego, his confidence. Damn it, I'll say it, his swag. Motherfucker grew swag right out of his chest. His song, which is titled after him, sings about how fucking awesome he is. How he can get any girl he wants. How he can eat five dozen eggs a day. How he's practically hunted every animal on earth. Gaston is just a beast in his own right. That movie had fun with Gaston, but also knew when to make him a legit threat. They weren't just playing him up for laughs alone. He's legitimately everything he says he is. He can shoot. He can fight. You genuinely think there is a chance at him killing the beast in the end when he tries to. But okay, let's focus on someone who's in the same shoes but a hero. When Rango arrives in the town of Dirt, he starts to hype himself up as this epic gunslinger who's killed a bunch of criminals with one single bullet. Now, sure, the people believe him right away there, but immediately soon after, Rango's forced to prove himself, which he does, albeit by accident. What I like about these two is that they're able to prove how good they are to the people. Whether it's a lie or not is irrelevant. The people in both movies have seen what the heroes can do, making their faith in that person, no matter how hyped up it is, more believable. For Gaston, it boosts his ego even higher and tells him he can pretty much get away with anything. And for Rango, the people's faith in him becomes a major part of his character arc. In the beginning of the movie, he was a nobody with no purpose, but by the end, he was a somebody who did have purpose. So my question now is, why in the fuck does everybody just believe in Sir Clorox? I understand why they're happy he's there, but why do they just believe him when he claims to be a knight? Why not have him actually prove himself? Again, you can do it through a sheer accident like Rango did, but at least the people would see him do it. I've just always had a problem with this kind of thing. The hero is trying to make everyone's lives better, but the people are just a bunch of idiots who don't know any better. They just blindly believe in some asshole whenever he tells them anything. Why is the hero trying to help these people that'll never be able to help themselves? But I'm getting sidetracked. Either really build him up and just get really stupid with how much he builds himself up like, like the stomp. Either really build him up and just get stupid with how much he builds himself up with, like Gaston. Sorry, I'm gonna try it again. Either really build him up and just get real stupid with it about how much he builds himself up with. Fuck. Either re. Oh, fuck. This one's really hard. Either really build him up and just get real stupid with how much he builds himself up with, like. Why is this the hardest thing I've ever had to say? Like, Jesus Christ. Either build him up and be dumb about it like Gaston, or actually make him become a knight in the end as it goes on. Jesus, that was so fucking difficult. Actually do something with him. Because all he is is too pathetic to take seriously either way. He's not empathetic enough to where you want to root for him, or threatening enough to make him a compelling villain. He's just lame. And I get that's the joke you're going for, but it ain't funny, and it doesn't change the fact that he's pointless. The closest thing he's got to relevance is that he kidnapped the princess in the end, but even then, Dale sent his men to kidnap her anyway. Sir Clorox scares them off, but then a few minutes later, he kidnaps her himself. So why not just have Dale's men kidnap her anyway since it didn't even matter? 
Like I said before, he's just a pointless waste of animation that doesn't add anything to the story and just takes precious screen time away from things that needed it more. Like, did Antonio really just want to voice a character in this movie? So you created one for him no matter how worthless he is? I don't get it! Everyone else is just kind of there. The grandma is nothing special. The dragon is nothing special. Dale's goons are nothing special. Actually, I take it back. There is one of them that kind of intrigued me. His name is Sota, and he's voiced by Rupert Everett, who played Prince Charming in the Shrek movies. And he is... Well, he's... Uh... Really, Sir H? We're going to get terribly healthy living here. But as they say, location, location, location. Oh, and jewelry too. Nice crown. Oh, oh dear. This life is going to be the death of me. Forgive us, my lord. I got held up in town. And I took advantage of the visit to see the latest fashions and to hear the latest gossips too. What are you wearing? Oh, you notice. One of my own creations. Do you like it? Being a soldier doesn't mean you can't have good taste. Power! And style. So... Anyone else have a problem with a gay actor playing an obvious gay stereotype? Like, does anyone see this as demeaning or anything, or is it just me? I mean, I guess that's up for Rupert to decide, but that's certainly very odd the longer you think about it. God, this movie's getting worse and worse the more I think about it. I mean, even the animation in this movie is shit. Now, I know that sounds a little harsh. Some people would look at this and go, what, what's wrong with it? You know, not every animated movie has to look like Spider-Verse or something. This is perfectly fine animation. As long as it doesn't look like turning red, then we'd have a real fucking problem. You know what? You're absolutely right, viewer. This is perfectly competent animation. Just not remarkable. This is a very boring movie to look at. From the staging, to the lighting, to the directing, nothing about this movie stands out in any visual way. Because this movie is so dialogue heavy, the animation can never truly shine or tell the story naturally. You know, like animation is supposed to do. The environments aren't that memorable. The character designs aren't that memorable. Justin is literally just hiccup as I said before. The animation in this movie is so stiff at times. Whenever it tries to have some childish slapstick or a fight scene, the animation always moves at the same speed as everything else. Because of this, the impacts of when characters hit the ground or take a punch or something just always looks off. Slapstick requires speed and impact to work properly, but when the animation is always moving at the same speed, then the joke just doesn't work. Not that the jokes in this movie are really that funny to begin with. Ah. Don't try this at home. Mm -hmm. ah. Whoa. Okay, okay. Was... Was that it? That was the joke. Justin said, don't try this at home, and the kid just said, okay, I won't. That's not a joke, asshole! The animation gives off really mad illumination vibes. Like how there's always so much fucking motion blur. Like seriously, I fucking hate that shit. Illumination puts so much motion blur in their movies to hide its cheap tricks. And this movie looks like it's doing the same damn thing. It looks awful. How am I supposed to enjoy the fights or the comedy when you practically blur them all out? If you're gonna point out that everything is motion blur, then let me ask you, does it always look like this? Look at movies like Kung Fu Panda, Mitchell's vs. the Machines, hell, even Raya and the Last Dragon. Those movies don't use an obnoxious amount of motion blur because those movies, unlike this one, want to look fucking presentable. I can forgive cheap animation if they use it in a visually engaging way. Movies like Toy Story 2 still hold up well despite their age because of how the story was told through the visuals. When I was watching this movie the second time, a thought went through my head. Is there a reason why Justin and the Knights of Valor is even animated? After much thought, the answer is no. This story could easily have been told in live action. There would be very little difference. If you were to ask that question about how to train your dragon, then the answer would be yes. That movie would not be the same if it was live action. The island of Burke, the grotto where Toothless lives, the dragons themselves, the sky and the flight sequences. This is stuff you can only do in the world of animation. Ask the same question about Rango? Yes. Encanto? Yes. Beauty and the Beast? Oh, bitch, please. We've already proven why that's better animated. Throughout the entire movie, only one scene stood out visually. Not only does it use a distinct style compared to the rest of the movie, but it also uses it to tell part of the story. I mean, sure, there's a narrator over it, but still, at least for once in this movie, the story is being told through a visual medium. Too bad it's information we already know about. The one scene in this movie that justifies this movie being animated at all, and it's fucking useless. Well fucking done. Oh, Jesus, the script is over 14 pages long. 
This movie was so boring to sit through, and yet I had this much to say. God, where's my life going? Where, where's my life coming to? What was even the point of all of this? Well, at least I'm now one video closer to 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, I call that an absolute win. Justin and the Knights of Valor is so dry, Gordon Ramsay couldn't help it with a bucket of water. It's bland. It's dull. It's uninspired. It barely tries anything at all. It is the most stock, predictable thing I've seen in a long time. And the few things that this movie did have going for it, the four producers on this movie got too nervous and had to go and ruin it. Not to mention it wastes such talented voice actors too. Like you got Freddie Highmore as Justin, Alfred Molina as Reginald, that's right, freaking Doc Ock, Rupert Everett's good, Mark Strong's really good, even Antonio is a talented actor. He's just a talented actor. And that's where he belongs. Throughout his entire career, Antonio has only produced two films. This being one of them. And with him being so proud to have his name on this, I think it's safe to tell him, this is not how you make an animated movie. You don't look at one movie's success and decide, how hard could it be? You can be inspired by it, but you still have to make it your own vision. Otherwise, your movie will just sit there and be remembered solely as the knockoff that it is. I read that apparently a sequel is in development, but I couldn't find anything else on it. But I think it's safe to assume since this movie came out in 2013 and only made $19 million in the box office, it's not gonna happen. Not to mention it's rotten ass 13% on Rotten Tomatoes. Jesus, that's actually worse than Dragon Ball Evolution score. That's quite a feat, dude. That's quite a feat. Actually, thinking about it again, there's also Talia's ass. That's what I call proper justification. I'm all the sins that you can't confess. I'm just your ghost if we're not undressed. A part of me wish that we never met. But you act like we never. Got to waste it in the bathroom of your parents' house.